uh, panel. I'll, How do we end, by the way? Well, five, it says 5.30 is, is, is when we're supposed to end, so we may, we may bleed over just a tiny bit. We're, 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 Thea Lea got us to the point of uh, policy, and you'll see here uh, assembled an, any number of policy, eminent policy folks. So we kind of move from theory through the real world and Stephen Roach to, to, what, to basically, so what do we do about this if this is a problem? And some of you may think it is it, meaning this whole issue of uh, terms of trade possibly deteriorating and so forth, although there's one panelist who will take issue with that, I trust. Uh, what, would we, what would we do about it? What are we going to do about it? You all have the, uh, bibli uh, the biographies here. I, I just always hate reading aloud from the, you know, what you have in front of you. Uh, Number of the pe these people you will know better than others, but we're going to do about five to ten minutes uh, of each person as keep it as tight as you can, as I told a number of you, I've only not had an opportunity to talk to Monty on the phone. Um, and um, the, so started out just with o sort of opening statements as much as anything else so you can get a sense of who these folks are and where they're coming from, and then we want to sort of mix it up, get into policy discussion specifically, get you guys back involved and so forth. So we start off with Clyde Prestowitz, his many books, uh, Japan, <laughs> what do I have? You all know who Clyde Prestowitz is. He's, <laughs> he's over here. <laughs> and uh, what, why don't you uh, take it off? Okay. And take uh, off and tell Paul, them anything you okay. think they need to know. Anything they need to know. Okay. <laughs> Paul, thanks. Um, I want to preface my comments with a response to a question that was posed to the last panel. The, one of the issues was why are some of these countries buying or investing <clears throat> in these low return uh, U.S. assets? And um, I think there are a number of reasons, but I think one reason is that uh, I think from their perspective, they see the trade exchange as being more than trade. Um, I think they see an infusion of technology and skills so that, that uh, by <clears throat> maintaining, by, by managing their currencies, by maintaining uh, a, an overvalued dollar or undervalued currencies, they not only uh, export products, but they effectively import uh, universities. I mean, a factory, in their view, I think, is a university. And I <clears throat> mention that because I want to use a recent uh, <clears throat> incident that I've been involved with to, to illustrate, I think, <clears throat> how uh, the earlier discussion ties into exactly what we're talking about here. Last week, uh, a guy named Igor Kondros was here in Washington. Uh, <clears throat> Igor is um, originally from the Ukraine. He uh, came out of the Ukraine in 1978 after Jackson Vanek. Uh, spent some time in Rome, tried to get Israel for some reason, couldn't get to Israel, tried to get to New Zealand, that didn't work, wound up in New York. Uh, he'd been trained in the Ukraine as, uh, as a materials engineer, got a job in New York, but went to school at night at Stevens Institute of Technology, got a PhD in material engineering, went to work for IBM at Fishkill, uh, worked on semiconductor packaging, and came up <clears throat> with a neat new idea for how to test semiconductor wafers. Uh, an important, uh, the, the, the technique is known as a probe card, and every wafer before it's cut into the chips has to be tested. His technique uh, increased the productivity efficiency by three or four times and has become the dominant uh, technology in the field. Uh, his wife worked for Citibank. She was his, in, his venture capitalist initially. She funded uh, this research that he did in his garage. But eventually he got some money in Silicon Valley, uh, <clears throat> started a company called Form Factor. Uh, this company is now located in Livermore, California. It has about 1,000 employees. Uh, the the uh, line workers in this company are uh, are average uh, three years of high school. They're not even high school grads. Their starting wage is forty thousand dollars a year. They have full medical benefits, pensions, all the rest of it. Uh, Four hundred million dollar company, growing at sixty percent annually. Exports eighty percent of its production. I mean, there could not be a more American story. Uh, immigrant, poor guy, dreams up new technology. And out of this, America gets what? A comparative advantage. Uh, <clears throat> before this guy came along, 
this, these test methods and equipment were made largely outside the U.S. and Asia. He comes along, innovates, new technology, suddenly U.S. is the leader in this technology, the leader in the industry, and he has a trade surplus. Now into this very bright picture comes a cloud <coughs> in the form of a company called FICOM, a Korean company closely related uh, in a Chaebol relationship with Hynix, a big Korean semiconductor manufacturer. Uh, and Hynix, in conjunction with the Korean Ministry of, in, of, of Industry, uh, is encouraging FICOM to develop a similar kind of product. In fact, so similar that it is copied directly. In fact, the copy is so good that frequently form factor is being sent FICOM probe cards to be repaired because the customer thinks it's a FICOM card. Uh, <coughs> So this is resulting in, in, I mean, obviously theft of intellectual property, loss of sales in Korea and elsewhere. And uh, you might think, well, why not just go to court and, and sue them on intellectual property uh, infringement? But the problem is that so much of this industry has moved outside the U.S. that suits in the U.S. don't mean a thing. There's no effective uh, uh, retaliation through a legal suit in the U.S. So you go to, you go to court in Korea. Uh, the patent office actually upholds the patent, and then it's appealed to a special patent court. And at that hearing, FICOM admits that they've copied the product, but argue the patent is invalid because the art is obvious, and the court upholds them. So form factor is now in litigation, appealing to the Supreme Court. This can go on for, I don't know, maybe 20 years, <coughs> during which time, uh, market share is declining. And, uh, and so Form Factor is now thinking, where should we put our next factory? And there's a lot of pressure on them from various parties in Korea to put their next factory in Korea or to license the technology in Korea uh, as a way of alleviating some of this problem with the intellectual property theft. There are other countries who are also approaching Form Factor and who are saying, look, um, you know, your base of cost would be a lot lower if you came here. For example, Singapore uh, has visited them, the Economic Development Board, and has said, look, if you, come, if you put your next factory in Singapore, 20-year uh, tax holiday, capital grant, 50% free land training of your workers, really reduce your cost base, allow you to spend more on R&D to out-invent these guys who are giving you a problem in Korea. So last week, Igor was in town where the U.S. government, as you know, is in the mode of negotiating a free trade agreement with Korea. Now, let's look at the overall macroeconomic context. The macro context is, as the previous panel said, zero U.S. savings, uh, <coughs> a, uh, uh, a currency uh, regime here which is essentially managed. Uh, Korea and all of the other Asian countries intervene in the markets to, uh, to keep their currencies undervalued vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. In fact, I met last month with a high official of the Ministry of Finance in Korea who said the Korean won is not going to strengthen any further. And I said, how do you know? He said, because we're not going to let it. Uh, <coughs> so that's the kind of the macro context. Of course, the U.S. has this big trade deficit. Uh, and so the idea was we would visit U.S. officials. We'd go to USTR, Commerce, State, National Security Council, make all the rounds here in Washington, and see if we couldn't get some, uh, get this on the government agenda. I mean, we're negotiating a deal with Korea. Surely the U.S. government would not want to sign a free trade deal while this is going on. So we went and we visited all of the likely suspects. And, you know, the response was kind of... Um, well, yeah, you're in the court. Uh, do you have a good lawyer? Um, and, um, well, gee, have you thought of putting a plan in Korea? Uh, or, you know, maybe you could actually go to Singapore. It would really reduce your cost basis. Um, so, now, let's think about that for a moment. Uh, the attitude here in the U.S. of the policymakers is shaped by this paradigm that Ralph and and Bill Balmo were talking about earlier. It's shaped by this thinking that trade is always win-win. Uh, it doesn't matter where these factories are. And uh, yeah, it's too bad for form factor, and yeah, we'd prefer if the 
Koreans didn't rip off their intellectual property, but hey, it's not really important for our trade negotiations. It's not a life or death thing for, and in fact, one official said, look, I've got 2,000 companies coming here and everybody wants to make their issue the make or break for the trade negotiation. And if we do it that way, we'll never get a free trade deal. <coughs> and that thinking is formed by the assumptions behind the paradigm that Ralph and, and Bill were talking about earlier. Um, now, but let's think about what happens. So the next factory, this very rapidly growing company moves, maybe takes the Singapore offer, moves to Singapore. So now a fair amount of technology is moving offshore, which is creating an alternative location of potential comparative advantage. Uh, <clears throat> fewer American workers are getting paid $40,000 a year, and so, so you know, even if they wanted to save, they can't save because they don't have the wages anymore. The company is still making high profits, but many of those profits are offshore, they're not taxable, so the US budget deficit gets bigger, and hence the US trade deficit gets bigger. Uh, and, and this is kind of, in my view, what flows from a conjunction of the context that Steve Roach mentioned, and the assumptions and the mental paradigm and the philosophy that has grown out of the, the assumptions and the thinking of kind of neoclassical uh, comparative trade, <coughs> free trade theory. Uh, what would I do about it? Well, first of all, it seems to me ridiculous that, that the United States um, uh, acquiesces kind of uh, uh, willingly in outsourcing the management of the value of the dollar to uh, its Asian trading partners. Uh, <coughs> we do have the ability to, to have some influence on that. And uh, I think that it should be a matter of high priority that there's no reason that the Japanese are intervening in the currency markets. Japan is committed in the OECD to floating its currency. It should float its currency. Korea should float its currency. No dirty floats. Just play by the rules. Secondly, Singapore's financial uh, investment incentives, and Singapore's not alone. I mean, virtually, uh, as you all know, many, many countries around the world do this. The American states do this. Very important point to make is California, Washington, Philip, Pennsylvania, all the states do it, but the national, the federal government doesn't do it, and that's very important because tax holidays, the meaningful tax holidays, come primarily from the feds, or they could come primarily from the feds. Anyhow, <coughs> point is this is a huge distortion of market forces. Uh, <coughs> we in the GATT, in the WTO, we have negotiated to control and, and, and put under discipline trade export trade subsidies. These are nothing more than indirect export trade subsidies. We should negotiate in the WTO or bilaterally. We have a bilateral free trade agreement with Singapore and with others. We should negotiate bilaterally to discipline those so that either they don't do it or they do it in a less uh, aggressive manner or we do it. Uh, but again, let's have everybody kind of playing the same game. And finally, it's so interesting to me that the Economic Development Board in Singapore the Economic Development Board in Malaysia, Israel, Ireland, France, China, they all know this company. It's only a $400 million company. They're all fully aware of this company. They're sending representatives to Livermore every other day to talk to Igor about where he's going to make his next investment. The officials of the U.S. government had no idea of this company and effectively don't really care where it puts its next factory. Uh, that should change. Thank you. <coughs> Great. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, Monty Graham, Ed Graham, uh, senior fellow at IIE, Institute for International Economics, certainly known traditionally as uh, a group that uh, supports free trade. The only thing I love to point out here is he's currently writing a history of quantum physics from Maxwell to Dirac in his spare time. <laughs> um, please. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Paul. Uh, you know, we're supposed to talk about policy here. But I kind of have a sense that we haven't really quite done it with the theory yet. Yeah, that would be great to tie so that we move. What do you think of the theory? And then what implications, if any, does it have for the policy? Let, let, let's take a look at that. that, that um, the, the really new theory that we've heard about is uh, that of uh, Will Bommel and Ralph Gomery. And uh, most of what Paul Samuelson is talking about really is kind of the old stuff applied to the current situation. And what they talk about are several things that are, I think, really tremendously interesting. They, they talk about high 
fixed sunk costs of entry. Um, the uh, I, I didn't see the word sunk costs. I think I saw uh, uh, what barriers to costs of entry. But uh, I, I think that if you think about it, the, these are in the nature of sunk costs, and that actually makes quite a difference. Um, they talk about scale economies. Uh, I didn't see uh, in the book, I've, I've actually read the book, I didn't see an actual specification of how you're modeling your scale economies, but we know that there is such an underlying uh, model. And um, now in a, some, in a different chapter, they talk about uh, industries that are essentially Ricardian, where costs are determined by uh, labor, uh, but where they talk about differing uh, productivities. And the general claim, and it's where we started this morning, um, Oh, we started this afternoon. It may seem like this morning, but yeah, it, it, we started this afternoon uh, was uh, with uh, the, the tableau that said this changes things, that this makes things a little bit different than they are in the classical theory. Classical theory. Oh, I got a little classical theory here. How's that? Uh, yeah. It's upside down? No, it's right side up. <laughs> Yeah. Th th those are Maxwell's equations. Uh, Chris Hill knows that. Uh, the, the former physicists in the room all know that. Th these are Maxwell's equations for uh, electromagnetics. And uh, what do they have to do with this? Well, actually, Paul just mentioned it. I I've been doing this little history, and one of the things is I've been actually reading Maxwell. You know something? Let's take another look at them. Maxwell never wrote them. These, what we call Maxwell's equations, are a later refinement of some theoretical ideas that James Clerk Maxwell presented in the 1870s. And you go to the original Maxwell, you won't see them. You'll see something that is vaguely of this sort, but it, it's not as clean, it's not as elegant. Um, and not only that, but if you read the original Maxwell, as I have done, you'll find a great deal of it's wrong. A lot of it is just plain wrong. And that's kind of the nature of uh, the way things progress, is that there are some good ideas. When originally presented, they're often enmeshed with some rather bad ideas, plain wrong ideas. And um, you know, to our two main presenters who are still here, I just want to say something. Reading your book, I had a little bit the same impression as reading Maxwell. I have, have a feeling that there's some stuff here that's really good. There's also some stuff that may prove ultimately to be quite wrong. And I think what's very important um, and why I come back to these theoretical issues is this is something that we need to sort out. Now let me do something else using the view graph, which is to, if I can open the pen here and if I can somehow draw it correctly, <coughs> I seem to recall something that kind of went like this. And let's make a quick shift of color some verticals here. These are more or less, well, they should be at the maxima. And we had here the zone of conflict. And here we had, as my initials, the MG, the MG Monte Grounds. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, mutual <laughs> means uh, zones. And, uh, and the Zoc in between. The question that really hit me, and it gets to the heart of what Clyde was just saying, and, uh, and, and quite a number of the interventions, uh, I didn't mean to turn that off, uh, is does that zone of conflict really exist? And that, that's, that's really the key question here, isn't it? Is, is, is an assertion that countries, <coughs> notice that these are countries, uh, what we'd have here is share of um, income, world income on this axis, total income of the country here. The, the, uh, you read the book and this zone of conflict occurs where per capita incomes are something uh, like equal. Um, the, it doesn't occur where the, the mutual gains are where the uh, per capita incomes are quite far apart. A lot of talk has come up um, in the uh, past sessions about uh, China. Have you looked at the per capita of China? You know, it, uh, on a real basis, you know, doing all of this kind of fluttering around and correcting for purchasing power parity, it's about 4,000 a year, maybe as high as 6,000 in some estimates. Uh, nominally, I think about 2,000 a year. What's the United States? I think we're pushing 40,000, if I recall correctly. Huge gap. China is clearly in this model in the mutual gains uh, region. The, um, uh, now, I I I according to the model. 
uh, th this would be the case. The, the, the zone of conflict is with countries that are of approximately equal income. That would be the European Union, Japan, etc. We had uh, Paul Samuelson making, I thought, what was a very interesting statement, and I wish that he had elaborated on it. He said that in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, that innovation in the United States almost surely caused incomes in the UK to go down, but he's not sure that the same has occurred in the post-war era. Now, and one of the things I have studied uh, uh, quite in detail is Korea. And um, incidentally, the sort of problem that Clyde uh, talks about is very real. Uh, the, the question is, is uh, the uh, many, many efforts that the Korean have made uh, made to overcome these problems of sunk cost scale economies. In many industries, semiconductors, they, they certainly have managed to overcome the sunk cost barrier and they have achieved a scale economy. That has certainly put them in a rising situation. The question is, is that forcing incomes down in the United States? The anecdote might suggest yes, at least in, in certain special cases. Frankly, I'm going to have to say I have my doubts. The, now, why, uh, if for no other reason than exactly what Paul Samuelson was saying, and that is that we have, you know, generally in the United States, uh, and, and leaving aside for the moment the stagnant wage issue, which I think has more to do with distribution than anything else, that we're still a rising ship. Why are we a rising ship? Well, some of my colleagues at IIE will tell you that we, we have, in the United States, we have significant productivity advances that are occurring throughout uh, the economy. Sooner or later, those do have to translate into uh, general wage rises. But in the meantime, the, the, the issue is, is, is basically this. Is between the United States and Korea, are we in a zone of conflict? And um, does the model apply in uh, this particular case? And what I would honestly have to say is that I am not sure that the empirical evidence is uh, very strong that, it, that that, in fact, is the case. Uh, now, two points that I'll make. That are, that one is we don't know what the counterfactual would be. Had Korea not overcome these sunk costs, uh, scale economies, uh, uh, types of issues, would U.S. incomes be even higher than they are now? Is it, in other words, has the potential for income raise uh, been uh, uh, somewhat undercut by uh, Korea's performance? Don't know. By, almost by ne definition, we don't know what the counterfactual might uh, have uh, been. Can we sort it out? Well, I think that's the big issue because, uh, again, the big issue is do these zones of conflict exist? And um, the answer rests upon this type of issue. Those of you that have looked at the debate on this, there are econo the econometricians are all over the map. Uh, there, there's, uh, what's his name, uh, out at UCLA, uh, uh, Lemer. Le Ed Lemer, who, who thinks that trade has very significantly at least affected the distribution of income in the United States, if not the absolute level. There are others who uh, discount uh, that uh, really uh, quite uh, highly. Okay, I'm going to come to the end here uh, pretty uh, quickly. Uh, what, what difference does China make? Well, Gi China now is yeah, China is in the uh, mutual uh, gains category. As China's income rises, if this model is correct, we are going to be, given the rates of growth in China, we are going to come into, if we're not there already, into as maybe the boundaries are so far over that we're already in a zone of conflict type uh, situation with China. That's a very, very big issue on which I'm going to remain very agnostic uh, for the moment. The one thing that I would say on this, and I've made quite a number of trips to China, I can assure you of one thing only about China. It's really big. <laughs> and they've got a lot of people. <laughs> if there is a zone of conflict type of issue that comes up with respect to China, that uh, it's going to... Is, it's going to create a set of problems that are of an order of magnitude bigger than those that we have, um, we do, or in some cases do not associate with uh, Korea, Japan uh, in the past. And that's just something that we really uh, do have to think about. Somebody said uh, absolute uh, size, uh, absolute scale makes a difference. Well, yeah, China, absolute scale, very big place. <laughs> and um, that um, is uh, of importance. Uh, one final point, hey, here I can really be impressive. Let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to Maxwell's theory. 
you know, there were a series of empirical things that occurred, uh, mostly in the late 19th, early 20th century, empirical observations that said, you know, the whole theory is actually not quite correct. And um, so, you know, it, it, it got replaced by something that looks like this. Ooh. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Your shoulder is blocking it. Oh, oh, and since yeah. everybody can follow yeah. every notation, I think they'd want to see it to make sure you're H right. 2m over h bar e minus b side, and then we have 2m over h bar, uh, what is it, imaginary here, delta psi, delta t. What is that? That, that Schrodinger's equation, that's the quantum interpretation of electromagnetics. Uh, In this case, the, the Schrodinger's equation for an unbound electron, that completely upset the apple cart. And uh, the, uh, the question that uh, I want to pose is, is the bommel gomery because of the postulate of the zones of, uh, of, of conflict, is it going to upset the apple cart in the way that Schrodinger did, or is it, as was the case of much of Maxwell's writings, was it just basically finally shown not to be correct? And I don't think we've answered that question, and so that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you for that. that. That's the most abstruse analogy I have encountered <laughs> in 30 years as a journalist. It's, I'm sure it's brilliant, but I, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. Do you want it on McNeil Laird? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I sure a, your audience... I have a feeling if I pitch that one, it's going <laughs> to meet with a few moments of skepticism and a quick exit. Um, <laughs> that, uh, I, do, I, I did actually follow... <laughs> Uh, the argument, and for those of you, uh, the 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 Gomery um, Baumol book is quite small, and the second half of it is technical. The first half of it goes into what Monty was talking about. It really is. You are able to decipher at the end of it what he, you know what he drew and what was there earlier. It's quite interesting, and I would recommend it to you all, particularly after hearing that, uh, so that you would know what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he said there's another edition with Maxwell's uh, equations as an appendix. And, uh, and Schrodinger, Schrodinger is uh, appendix too, isn't it? Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, Schrodinger's appendix? <laughs> Schrodinger's appendix. It's the cat's. It's actually Schrodinger's cat's appendix. Um, uh, Tom Pally, uh, former chief economist with the U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission, uh, uh, assistant director of public policy at AFL-CIO, author of a number of books, uh, written for the Atlantic Monthly and so forth, uh, written for Challenge Magazine as well. Uh, why don't you take it, Tom, and uh, as quickly Great. as you can. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. It, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, Ralph, Bill, Paul Samuelson are some of the economists and public policy leaders that I, I just admire the most. And one thing I want to say, I think I echo what Monty said here, I, I think this stuff is really important and has been somewhat dismissed by the economics profession. I think of the sort of response that Avinash Dixit and uh, Gene Grossman wrote in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, sort of dismissing uh, the ideas that Paul Samuelson put forward, and I, I hope I'm going to show you why. By the way, I did write a paper for this that sort of summarizes, or rather this summarizes what's in the paper, so anything that's not absolutely crystal clear here is, I'm sure, clear in the paper. It, it, it actually, the paper is extremely clear. I would highly recommend it. Thank you, Paul. Um, Let's see the over. Let's get to the main concern. GBS is Go uh, Gomery, Beaumont, and, uh, and Samuelson. Their question is: What is the future impact of international trade on nas U.S. national income? They are looking forward, not looking back. What does trade in the future mean for the U.S.? Point number one: This is not about protectionism. How could it be? Paul Samuelson is one of the contributors of the Heckscher Olin Samuelson model. He's one of the developers of modern trade theory. They both believe there are gains for all in trade. There are always gains for all in trade. The issue that emerges is how do the gains from trade and their distribution change over time? Are we going to have more of the gains from trade in the future or less? That's the big question. And that question opens a whole new policy agenda about how to maximize our share of gains from trade and how to hold on to them. That's not how economists have approached the trade debate before. So I want to also say that I think GBS break new theoretical ground. And this, too, is very, very important. You cannot change trade policy with another study 
showing how trade adversely affects wages, how trade destroys manufacturing jobs, how trade causes trade deficits, whatever. You need a new theoretical argument, and GBS have provided that, and that's very, very important. So then, what's the issue? Two things I want to take off the table, because they do get confused here. The GBS critique is not about trade and income distribution. Paul Samuelson made a major contribution to this in the Stolper-Samuelson uh, uh, theorem. The issue remains, there is still a question about income distribution that Thea Lee raised. But this is in addition to it, it's supplementary to it. So if you had one complaint already, now you've got another. And it's not about trade-induced wage job loss, uh, uh, wage losses and job uh, dislocations, i.e. Uh, Laurie Kletzer and Howard Rosen have talked a lot about wage insurance and so on. That issue remains, but that's not the issue they're talking about. So now we have three issues, income distribution, losses that need compensation, yes, wage insurance, and still this bigger issue, what does the future mean for our gains from trade? And that is then the issue, the dynamic evolution of comparative advantage and its impact on the distribution of gains from trade. Now, how are these gains from trade distributed? Well, all economists know they depend on global demand and supply conditions. If you have strong global demand for your product, it's going to drive up the price of the product you export, and you're going to get an increased share of gains from trade. You can also, hypothetically, if a country increases its productivity, it can potentially have a decline in gains from trade. Why? Because it adds to global supply, drives down the price of its exports, and it then suffers. That is what uh, Harry Johnson, a long time ago, 1954 and 55, two great papers, and then subsequently Jagdish Bhagwati in 1958. They were talking really back then about commodity trade. And then the, the people knew from the work of uh, Prabish and Singer that there was a declining terms of trade for developing countries. Why? They argued potentially because mining improved, agriculture improved, and pr 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 uh, commodity prices fell. Now, in the post-World War II era, the U.S. did very, very well from trade. I seriously believe that. There was a strong demand for capital goods, and there were few suppliers, and therefore we did well. The question again, will this continue? Now, let's get to Paul Samuelson's argument. Paul Samuelson examines the implications of economic catch-up. This does twist. It's a major, major, I mean, as an economist, I think part of the reason why uh, economists reject him is maybe there's a little bit of envy. Yes, the theory's out there. But Mr. Samuelson saw how to apply it to this new issue, not about rising productivity in mines and agriculture, but about catch-up. What are the implications of economic catch-up overseas? And if the catch-up is concentrated in your export industries, U.S. export industries, then it could reduce the U.S. share of gains from trade. Again, even under Paul Samuelson's Act II in his paper, trade still benefits. But trade does not benefit as much as before. Once China catches up with us, we lose some of our share of the gains from trade. That's the, the, the Heineck ego problem. Now, why does, it, why does it happen that way? Because we may, they may increase, if they start producing the goods we export, you increase the global supply, you drive down the price, the U.S. leads. And here's a very important point. I didn't realize it until I read Paul Sa I, I'd, I'd thought about the question, hadn't been able to answer it. The U.S. does not automatically benefit when foreign countries develop even though world income rises. That's a very important point. I'd always thought that when they got more productive, everybody got better because the global production possibility frontier expanded. No, it turns out, though the global production possibility frontier expands, we don't necessarily do better from it. Now, Gomery and Baumol come along with a sort of more realistic world, and they model it with increasing returns to scale, which I think captures many processes in the world. In that case, you can have multiple possible equilibria, and the U.S. share of gains from trade vary with each of those equilibria. Now, what's very important about increasing returns is that the country that gets to produce first gets a head start and moves down its average cost curve, and it then becomes the producer. And there's some corollary propositions that come from this. First of all, only by chance does the actual equilibrium maximize world equilibrium. You could see a very inefficient country start first, get a lead, become the low-cost producer, and then stay that way. But it would be better if we could rearrange global production and get the truly efficient producer to take over. So there's a distinction between what I call comparative advantage and ruling comparative advantage. You acquire ruling comparative advantage by being first. The other very important proposition that comes out of this, and I, don't think, I think these guys are Schrodinger, not Maxwell, uh, is that increasing returns equilibria are very fragile. They can be changed 
by policies that gives firms a chance to move down their cost curve. So if you're a, a late mover, a second comer, there are several ways you can get ahead of the first comer and move down your cost curve and become the dominant producer. So let me take the policy implications because that's what we want about. You have to understand the theory, though, to get to the policy implications. And I want to say again, the theory is so important, this is the only way you're going to be able to change trade policy by telling a different story, and then it actually fills in with all the empirical data that we have about job losses, wages, and so on. We have a much, much broader trade policy agenda now. It's not just tariffs, subsidies, quotas, export taxes, and so on. Far, far more is on stake. We have to focus on competitiveness and the forces driving industrial and technical development in a country. And most importantly now, you have the possibility for rivalrous strategic policy between countries. As countries follow this competitive agenda, if one country does it and the other doesn't, you can be outgamed in this world. This is new. So let's go through policy implications. Well, the first policy I want to put high up, Ralph again raised it, there is the deep conflict between company interests and national interests. Companies have gone global. That means that their actions now maximize global output, global income. And they also maximize company profits. And thank goodness they do, because in some sense, you know, this is the fiduciary duty of the companies. But it does not maximize national income. So GM may be maximizing global income. GM may be maximizing GM profits. But it is not maximizing U.S. income. And policymakers don't understand that. Now, one of the important things is that China... Their corporations are compelled to, to internalize Chinese national interests. So if you're a Chinese shareholder, you're not doing as well as an American shareholder. But if you're a Chinese person or citizen, you're doing better than an American citizen because the policy is being internalized. So most importantly, we need an agenda for realigning corporate and national interest. This is no longer the GM of the 1950s when what was good for GM was good for the country. It wasn't because GM was altruistic, it was because GM had not gone global and therefore almost accidentally its own interest, profits, aligned with national interest. Outsourcing. Companies are happy to outsource. Why? Because they earn profits that they can then repatriate. But this could reduce the gains from US trade. Viz Boeing. Boeing makes great profits. It seals the deal in China. It makes the profits on the production in China, but it's not necessarily good for US national income. Education, science, and innovation are not enough. Because even if you develop the innovations at home, what's to say that the company is not going to apply them offshore rather than in new US factories as they would have done 30 years ago? Strategic policy, I've already talked about. This is a rivalrous world. You can use undervalued exchange rates to lower your costs internationally and thereby displace the existing global leader. Exchange rates and money are not neutral in this world. They can change the equilibrium. You can exploit lower labor costs that capture industry share. This is where the China 301 case comes in. Exploitation of workers can shift down the whole average cost curve. It's not good for workers, but it is good for the industry in the sense that you can capture an industry in that way. And that's why that's one of the things that has to be on the trade policy agenda. Domestic procurement. You can favor domestic suppliers. Bulk up quantity at them, get them to move down their average cost curve, and therefore capture the industry. And something I want to emphasize here, the financing of health and social insurance costs. In the U.S., that's a job cost. It comes attached to a job. If you finance it from federal revenues, then you're no longer making it a job cost. You're therefore giving your companies some additional advantage. You remove the incentive for them to offshore, and you can even partially pay for it by taxing the profits they earn uh, offshore. So here's the policy principles. I think we need to restructure our talk about the policy debate. I think of policy in terms of structure and atmosphere. I'm not talking about picking winners. People talk about industrial policy as picking winners. I have, I, every government civil servant I've met, I don't believe they have any comparative advantage in picking winners. I think I'll do a better job than they will. <laughs> but you need structure. What does structure mean? It means national and international laws and rules that create the right incentives. Then you need atmosphere. Atmosphere is economic conditions that are favorable to business performance. That means full empo employment, strong demand at home, low interest rates, and competitively valued exchange rates. That's the way that we should sort of be thinking about policy. Last slide. There is a parallel macroeconomic critique. What Bomol, uh, what Gomery and Bomol and Samuelson are dealing with is it's a microeconomic critique of trade. It's based on pure trade theory. It actually assumes full employment and balanced trade. What's so important is even with those assumptions, you can get these interesting new trade policies. 
Their arguments are bolstered by macroeconomics. When you have unemployment, when you have trade deficits, when you have financial instability, the possibility of inter financial instability, this feeds back into to reinforce all the type of policies that come out of their microeconomics. And I'd be glad if we got the conversation back. I thought this afternoon's conversation got rather lost. I'd like to clear up some uh, confusions there too if I get an opportunity. Wow. Uh, well, that was, uh, that was very helpful. Uh, indeed. Um, I, I told you that, and his paper uh, will, was well worth reading to, to review a lot of that. Phil, Phil Swagel gets the uh, last turn here, and then we go to the audience, so Phil, as, as quickly as you can. Phil, you have to rebut <laughs> everything that already <laughs> went on. He's with the American Enterprise Institute, teaches, was the White House Council of Economic Advisors, uh, and has also, with Greg Mankiw, in your packet, uh, another article, if you spent all this time being here today, then you might as well invest a little more, although it might have been a sunk cost, I suppose. But the, uh, I would uh, recommend their paper as well to hear the other side of this, which you will hear some of right now. Great. Great. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I'll also try to connect to the policy, the theory to the policy, and, and be somewhat forward-looking. Um, I, uh, I brought with me my, my father's uh, third edition of Samuelson, published in 1955. Um, that he used at uh, Rensselaer in 1958, I think, or 50, oh, his class of 58. Um, and uh, looking over the sections on trade, uh, I realized that this paper that, that we heard about today is actually a longtime subject of uh, Professor Samuelson, and that in his um, discussion of trade in the principles text of 1955, um, he talks about how the dynamic economy poses important caveats to the, the, um, the you know, general trade model, the, the general idea of, of, of free trade. And, and, you know, in the third edition, he talked about the infant industry uh, argument and some other things like that. Um, but, but you can see the clear intellectual connection to his uh, 2004 uh, paper in the, uh, the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, and again, the, the general idea is that the dynamic evolution of the economy has an important impact uh, on trade. The, the downside, uh, as we just heard, of the story is that if China gets good at, at our exports, then the terms, of the terms of trade will go against the United States. That is, the price of our imports will rise, and the price of our exports will decline. This will lead to less trade, and the United States will lose some of the gains from trade. Now, my sense is that, until today, this has not been much of a, of a problem. The, the data suggests the opposite, that the price of US imports has been falling. And, and my sense, I, I spent um, three and a half years at the White House uh, across the Clinton and Bush administrations, working on trade policy, among other things. And generally, the problems we had were when the price of imports was too low, not, not uh, too high. Um, Mankiw and I have another paper on the anti-dumping laws that, uh, that goes through that, uh, that policy. Um, you know, it's worthwhile, of course, talking about the gains in trade, that when import prices are low, that's, that's typically a good thing for the United States, that the price of, of apparel and clothing is down about 10%. Since 1995, when uh, when the Uruguay round was, uh, I guess, took effect, um, and, and the overall CPI is up somewhere between 30 and 40 percent uh, over that time. I don't have the exact number at my fingertips. So that, to me, that's the gains from trade that you see the, the tradable, the price of tradables going down. And anyone who buys a, a new suit or new clothing, you know, can see that uh, uh, right away. And actually, some of us at CA we want to put a chart to that effect in the economic report of the president, and we're we're told that would be uh, impolitic. Um, uh, but you can see our tone deafness if you read the paper um, on, on other issues. Um, so trade has been good for the United States. Many, many, many people are hurt by trade. Overall, the nation, uh, the nation has gained. And I realize in, in saying this that I sound somewhat like the old trade theory guy. Um, I'm older than I look, but I, I recognize the irony of that. Um, uh, you know, again, so even if, if this is all a theoretical curiosity so far, the future, of course, is what matters. Um, and uh, anyone who's interested in outsourcing, Alan Blinder has a nice paper on this in Foreign Affairs, which also is very much forward-looking and is a nice counterpoint, I, I thought, to the one that Mankiw and I did. Um, you know, is there a danger, and, and what should we do about it? A little bit, I feel like this echoes a de an earlier debate in which trade theorists speculated that the future world would involve diminished trade flows because countries would, would have similar technologies and would, would grow similar, and so the scope for trade would uh, diminish. And of course, this turned out to be completely wrong because it, there's a lot of what, what we refer to as intra-industry trade, so similar products going back and forth between apparently similar um, countries. 
Uh, today, of course, the, the rise of global sourcing has given way to, to new types of trade. And, and now my understanding is that the majority of global trade is actually conducted within the boundaries of multinational firms. Um, sometimes this is seen a, a, as a problem. I, I think to myself, this is not my saying, but one of my favorite sayings is that if something, if a problem cannot be solved, it, it's no longer a problem but a fact of life. And obviously global sourcing is a, is a fact of life. Um, so so w with all that in, in mind and with humility that we, we don't know the future, what, what should we do? So let me talk about policies. M my rule of thumb is to focus on things that are problems and, and not get distracted by, by symbolic issues. And I, I know that's, that, that's, that's a personal rule of thumb. It's a difficult one here. Um, to, to me, the real challenges are, I have a, a, a short list. Number one is to keep a strong economy. Right? In, in the 1990s, globalization proceeded, outsourcing, um, you know, ramped up substantially. Um, and, and yet we had a strong economy and strong job creation, and, and the current account deficit got, got wider, and yet you know, we, managed, uh, we managed to be OK. Um, there's obviously this strong disagreement on how to get a strong economy, but, but not on, on the goal. Um, number two would be to keep an open, tra open trading system at home and with other nations. So uh, avoid burdensome regulation in inside our borders and harmful barriers uh, outside of them. Um, as Paul mentioned, I teach international finance, and I realize I'm just giving you the lecture on the Washington Consensus, so which uh, <laughs> widely discredited. Um, so big grain of salt here. Um, number three on my, my little list here, and I'm, I'm almost done, is uh, to recognize that there are, there are losers and, and to actually do something about it. it. It's one of the mysteries to me, both inside the government and out, is that there's broad support for improved policies a aimed at adjustment. Um, I, I read Gene Sperling's book carefully. I, I wrote a book review of it. And he has a great section about adjustment assistance, and others do as well. And yet, somehow, it never, uh, it, it never comes together. Um, and, and you know, I think there's also, also consensus that policy should focus not just on trade, but on adjustment broadly. It's not my idea. I think it's, it's everyone's idea. Um, and, and number four, there's, there's a, um, a policy challenge to provide uh, and, and a role for the government to provide appropriate public goods. So education, infrastructure, national defense, the rule of law, research and, and development, you know, especially focused on, on, on basic R&D and, and, and on and on. There's always a gray line about what's, what's basic and what's commercial. Um, and to me, that's the source of problems. I, I, I lean in the direction of allowing markets to choose the winning technologies. So you know, we all know, looking at our en energy problem, there are many possibilities for future sources of energy, um, I, I'm skeptical, as I think we all are, that government officials, even the best of them and the best intentions, can look over the horizon and choose the right one. And, and as we all know, the importance of Iowa, I'm doubly uh, skeptical that political officials can, uh, can do the same. Um, uh, so that sort of brings me to multiple equilibrium. And, and, and yes, we, we know the theory you know, has a lot to it, that, that there are the possibility of mo multiple equilibria. I, I just take great caution at, at choosing um, and, and trying to choose policies to affect which, which equilibrium we end up at decades in, into the future. And, and that's why I, I shy away from this activist interpretation of the, of the, of the theories. Um, and, and I know it seems to work at times, right? Uh, you know, a couple years ago, if you were in Europe, you'd point to Airbus and say, look, you know, we, we really nailed it. We got it right. Um, you know, now it doesn't look, it doesn't look uh, quite as good for, for Airbus. Um, so, so I... I you know, I, I think there's disagreement there. There's agreement on some things. The more basic and more public the action, um, the, the more consensus. Let me just finish by saying the second part of my rule of thumb, maybe just one more minute, about avoiding distractions. And I think two of them are, well, one is outsourcing, and, and the second is China. Um, the US, there's a chart, a page of charts in our paper showing that the US has a large and growing surplus in trade and business and professional and technical services. So the US is very good at outsourcing. And we're getting better over time. And so a cynic might say, well, the more the better. And you know, obviously that, that's from, a certain, from the perspective of the whole economy, but not from the perspective of, of individuals. And obviously the people who are the losers lose, lose very much um, from, from outsourcing. Um, uh, on China, you know, I feel like a lot of focus on the exchange rate issue is, is something of a distraction. Um, and, and the real issues are intellectual property, where, where China is obviously stealing U.S. property, 
getting them to open up and get, getting them to establish a social safety net to catalyze spending by, by uh, Chinese families. So that's the kind of things I mean on the second part of my rule of thumb, is focus on, on the issues that, that would matter for trade and not get dis distracted by the ones that, uh, that don't as much. Great, thank you. Thanks, Phil. And, and please go. Um, and, and thank you all. Let, let's, I, I had thought that what I might do is literally enumerate policies and see what you each uh, think of them and so forth. I, I'm going to just moot one because it's the standard fallback that in debates like this and, you know, that I, I've been covering this issue for, I guess, about 30 years now, um, which is education. You know, okay, well, here, one key, all right, we've heard about macro policy, we've heard about the possible limits of macro policy, we've heard a number of other uh, ideas here and the general uh, way that Tom was conceptualizing it, both in terms of structure and atmosphere, which I thought was an interesting and provocative word. Uh, but you always come back to hearing about education. If we had a more educated, a more skilled workforce, that's all else equal, we should surely be doing that. Yes, Clyde, should we surely be doing that? Or should we be investing more in education? Or is, are we sort of, is that oh, yesterday's yeah, I mean, look, story? Look, I mean, of course. Uh, but that's motherhood and the flag. And, and the reason the education thing comes up all the time is because it's an easy way to avoid uh, addressing the issue. Sure, we should be educating more. But education is not going to address the issues that <coughs> Ralph raised and that Tom explicated. Um, it's, you know, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Monty? I wouldn't say that it's a sufficient condition. It certainly is a necessary condition. I personally think that we are significantly under-investing in education, and therefore I would discount Clyde's comment that it's a way of avoiding the problem because it is a problem, uh, and uh, we need to do something about it. It is a problem, but it's not the trade problem. Well, it, but it, 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 it plays into it. Uh, yeah, of course and, and it plays into it, but it's not the trade problem. What is the trade problem? The trade problem is the, the discussion we've been having for the last two and a half hours, which uh, I think everybody here is, uh, is aware of. But the trade, but how do we, and we address the trade problem by, by muscling, muscling the people with whom we're trading. Uh, that's no, I, 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 don't, I don't think that follows. Uh, I mean, I, I laid out <clears throat> in my anecdote two or three things that are perfectly within uh, the normal negotiating boundaries uh, but of I, 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 negotiating. I, I, I had nothing to do with muscle. Well, yes. It, just, it had to do with changing our own policies. Well, no, but it was, also, it was prevailing upon our negotiating. It was negotiating no, you could, you, we, we could, being tough on them, no, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, I just misunderstood. I, just no, I mean, if we want to match Singapore's uh, financial incentives, is that being tough on Singapore? Oh, no, no, not if that we ask, If we ask the Japanese to abide by their commitments in the OECD, is that being tough on, on Japan? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. is there, I, I'll take a vote on that. How many people think that that would be being tough on Japan? I mean, it's not being... I mean, I, mean, they, they, I don't mean it's being mean to Japan or bad to Japan or unfair to Japan, but it is being tough on Japan. It's tougher than we are currently being, oh, isn't that right? Oh, come on. I mean... What, in the, in the, what was it, in the mid-90s, I guess, uh, Mickey Cantor threatened uh, 301 sanctions on imports of uh, Lexuses, as I recall. That's being tough. Uh, I didn't support that. But asking the Japanese to just kind of do what they said they're going to do in the OECD, I, to me, that, I, don't, I don't see that as tough. And I, I'm, on Clyde's, I'm on Clyde's side here that uh, asking people to live up to their agreements is... Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I meant it... Yeah. It's fair that game. way. I, yeah. I'm not disagreeing with that. Uh, Tom, um, education? Well, I'm, I'm like Ty. Yes to, yes to more education, but lots more as well. Lots of other things too. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, also do, apple do, pie. You know, training, adjustment. I, I, I have one note just that in some sense we have two different education yeah. systems in the U.S. where we have colleges and universities and then below that. And, you know, it seems to me the problem is, is below the college and university is still. Uh, or at, or also at the community college level, right? Uh, my understanding is our, our community colleges are actually doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. in the community college, the research I'm remediation. The research I'm aware of is that the uh, spending a year or two at community college, you get basically the same return as spending a year or two at a four-year university. Right. In terms of the actual economic effect, uh, I have very heterodox views 
on education. Most of the breakthroughs of in, in innovation <clears throat> that we experienced in the past two centuries were made by Thomas Edison's who dropped out of school at 12, the Wright brothers who never went to high school. No, I'm serious. I think that the way we conduct education threatens imagination and threatens creativity. So I am not sure that There are professors clapping here. Yeah. <laughs> more, <Thank you. laughs> more than that, we spend billions we spend billions of dollars of edu on education without conducting any controlled experiments to find out what works. We don't, I remember when I, I was talked into teaching the new math to high school teachers, it turned out to be a complete waste of time. And we have, a, 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 fashion after fashion and education irresponsibly not trying to find out what works and waste more and more money no child behind let being left no child's behind, behind right it, it, yeah. <laughs> that's what it is really. I, all our children <laughs> left behind is part of the new untested policy i think pouring more money into education without careful analysis, careful experimentation is a crime, not a desirable policy. <laughs> Dr. Gomery. <laughs> I just would like to uh, reinforce and strengthen uh, what Will said. Um, <coughs> no, that would make sense, but they're not happening. Um, notably, the, the focus on the science of scores in K through 12, I think, is utter nonsense. Uh, Michael Teitelbaum, who may still be here, they all, uh, says that the 12th grade statistics relatively weak are very questionable. That the 12th grade statistics, can, can people hear him? No, no I, I was afraid of that. No, it was on, but you have to put it, what? it was okay. cutting in and out, I don't know why. Take the, uh, take the other mic, if you would. Clearly, mic training is very important. Yeah. No, yeah. no, that was the mic's fault, not yours, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, look, uh, I'm, I, I, obviously, if, if you just ask, uh, do you want more education, how can you say no? But I think you have to ask, how much value do you get for value put in? And uh, there's a lot of fuss about we're behind scientifically. It's First of all, it's not so clear. Second. The notion, and, and here's where Will and I are absolutely in sync, the notion that what you get out of going to high school is the ability to score uh, on facts, I think it is quite dangerous. I think you, you want to come out with your imagination uninjured, your willingness to do things, your interests are still alive, okay? And then if, if the government were in fact really interested in doing something about uh, having more scientists well-trained, the place to do it is the first and second years of college, which is where about half of the people drop out. Right? Furthermore, the federal government has... More, actually, more than half. Yeah, yeah more than half. Thank 60%. you. 60%. Uh, the federal government has enormous leverage on uh, the universities and, and colleges that do this, many of them being significantly supported by the government. They have no leverage except through legal action, really, to deal with K through 12. And so here you have where the big dropout is, and no, we can't get anyone to touch that because that would be touching their universities. And so I think this is all kind of unproven, nonsensical expansion, and no new ideas. I mean, this is just an old thing that's being kicked around for the 40th time. Now, one thing that isn't being used, and which is particularly uh, appropriate for the trade situation where you mm -hmm. want to strengthen the American worker, not his children, right, is online learning. You see, in this area, technology is simply ignored. Actually, the technology of online learning today is about equal to classroom, or maybe a little better. In other words, if you, if you take a college course with the same uh, pupil to, to uh, professor <laughs> ratio in the classroom or online, you get the same result. Now, I know that's counterintuitive, but it's true. 
and millions of people have done it. Okay, federal government doesn't hardly hardly knows it exists. Now here's a, a much cheaper form of education. Why is it cheaper? Not because it's cheaper to give the course, but because working people can go on working. They are not asked to give up everything for four years or three or two in order to be able to get a degree. Okay? And so the enormous potential for educating our workforce and the only thing that the federal government has done so far is make sure that the grants that are available to full-time students are not available to part-time students. The exact reverse of what should be happening. Uh, let me just follow up with the two of you. Since you guys have wrote this book, you've obviously thought a great deal about what the implications of the analysis are. And after all, the key message, at least that I got from the book, is that you want to get the productivity of your own industries, and therefore of your country as a whole, up. Yeah. So how do you do it? If you don't, if you maybe you do it through online as opposed to in the classroom. But wh I, what I really what are the things you've heard a, a panel of people talk about it? I what think, I think all of those things are, that have been suggested are closer, really closer, I, closer I, to your mouth. Oh, okay. here we go again. Yeah, no, well, no give me the other one back. <laughs> <laughs> no, this time it was you, don't not cover the antenna. <laughs> what? Don't cover the antenna with your hand. It fades when you do that. Was this the antenna? That's the antenna. <laughs> oh, I thought there was something else. <laughs> 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 well, I, I think you, in all these things, I have to ask, what do you get back for the money put in? All right? I think you'll get very little with most of the things that are proposed. But that does not mean, and by the way, I think that's in general about what do we do about this, that we are uh, recycling the same ideas, some of which may be good, but we really need a little more thought. Uh, but in the case of education, I have the thought, or at least a thought which is let's, exp let's have a GI Bill and send people who are motivated to college while they're working. Right? In other words, in the fight against the rest of the world, the soldiers are, are workers. And if they are willing to put their time and energy into it, why don't we help them? And they can go on working, which reduces, makes it possible for them as individuals to do this. Now, that's, there may be things wrong with this idea, but that's the kind of departure from the ordinary that we should be looking for. Then, in addition, you've got the great problem of the children at risk that come heavily from particular ethnic groups. And again, you toss money at the problem and develop policies the way medical cures were designed in the 18th century without a shred of evidence as to what works. I think that is an absolute crime when there are so many millions of children at stake and you do not begin to collect the relevant data to conduct controlled experiments to begin to find out what really constitutes education instead of just carrying them through school. Let's leave education for a, for a minute. Here, the discussion was largely about macro policy. I just uh, briefly, your response to the macro policy implications, whether you'd call it getting tougher on Japan or simply making them live up to their obligations, the idea that we should, in negotiations with other countries, let's just say, make them live up to their <coughs> explicit obligations, the things that they have said they were going to do, as for example, which is what Clyde you know, stressed, and, and some of the others. I, th I think that is fine, but it is misleading because growth is as much a matter of micro policy as macro policy, and we have been focusing on the Washington Consensus, which is all about macro policy. And I think that's one of the reasons it has failed so consistently. For example, one of the things that has uh, accounted for gr uh, our remarkable uh, innovation record, and it is remarkable. We still come ahead, out ahead in number of patents, way ahead of the world. We come ahead of the world in terms of Nobel Prizes year after year. And the 
part of the of our accomplishment comes from the fact that for a large sector of the economy, the firm is faced with innovation as a matter of life and death. It has become what one economist called a red queen game in which you have to run as fast as you can in order to stand still. And uh, measures that will enhance the power of that red queen game that will force the firms to fight harder and harder to beat their competitors in the innovation game will be something that is a gain for them, but above all, a gain for the rest of us. So, then so Clyde, for example, was involved for years, as many of you know, with Semitech, or, or used to talk about Semitech as, as, some, as an important kind of industrial policy. Is that fair? I don't want to miss No, I was not involved in Semitech. But I mean, you, no. it was something I remember you tell, being the first person to talk, to talk to me about, so maybe that's why I'm complaining. Yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't. But, but uh, and in, <laughs> so that I'm, so that I'm misremembering. But the, the, the point is, do, are you talking about things like Semitech, which was the semiconductor consortium back in the 1980s, where, where we had, where the United States actually took steps toward trying to make companies in America competitive? No, absolutely not. I am ag as against uh, picking winners as several of us have said because we fail at that game. Uh, first of all, I... So how do you get us to be more well, productive? Well, there are two things that come... I, I have a long list that I've written in, uh, for other purposes. But just give us a taste, a No, yeah. no, but let me say a couple of things. First of all, uh, uh, the easy entry of entrepreneurs is very important, and if we want to subsidize it, I would do it by offering guarantees to banks and let the banks pick who the winners are, not let the government pick the winners. So and when you say micro, you're talking about at that micro level, both microeconomic and micro small. Uh, that too. No, no, but in the giant oligopoly firms, which are, I think, one of the great sources of innovative improvement. I mean, look at how much Intel uh, increased the speed of the computer chip over 30 years. Do you know what percentage? It was approximately 3 million percent increase in speed by little innovative improvements year after year. Why did they do it? Because I've spoken to more CEOs who tell me their nightmare isn't better advertising by their competitor, lower pricing. It's coming out with a better computer chip before they do. That's the nature of a powerful red queen game. Keep, make sure that those oligopolists compete and compete in terms of innovation. Tom, well, please. Well, yeah. I, I, I think we need to get, we get, need to get off this. <coughs> is, is this working now? Yeah. We need to get off this pattern of either or. We need good micro policy and good macro policy. So that's right. Now, now, let me say that I, I think that if I were to sort of say which is the more important in a hierarchy of things, I would have to go for macroeconomic policy. Uh, there's a famous saying, I, I, I guess. Is it James Tobin saying, it takes a heap of Harberger triangles to fill an oaken gap? That, that is the <laughs> idea that inefficiencies, microeconomic inefficiencies, are much, much less costly to an economy than a business cycle downturn, a macroeconomic inefficiency. And that same logic applies to the story of growth. When Tobin talked about it, he was talking about sort of performance at a moment in time. Recessions are much more costly than sort of a, uh, an inefficiency because you've got a price rigidity somewhere. Now, for growth, we need investment. And that's what really drives this economy. That's what all the studies show, that productivity growth is very, very tied to how much investment. And innovation comes with investment. So how do you get investment in an economy? Now, one thing I want to take off the table right away is something we heard th earlier this afternoon from Steve, uh, St Steve Roach about saving. It's clearly, sa there's no sh saving shortage in this economy. How ca it makes no sense. Corporate profits are at records. Companies are buying back stock at un unheard of levels. These companies are not short of money. We're coming off a period of low, the lowest interest rates in 40 years. 
If there were a saving shortage, none of that would be going on. What it is about is about demand, the pattern of demand. There's a global shortage of demand, and the pattern of demand is wrong. There's lots of demand coming from America, but it is going for goods produced in China, not for goods produced in America. You want investment. You need the incentives that are going to get American companies to invest in America, put their factories in America. Now, of course, that means interest rates, but it also means, most critically, exchange rates. And it can't just be a temporary reduction. The reduction has got to be permanent and credible. So that if I'm a, uh, a business manager for IBM, uh, I'm going to believe that the exchange rate is going to keep me stable and keep me competitive for the next 10 years and therefore justify putting a plant here. If I don't believe that, I'm not going to put it there even if the, the exchange rate comes down. So it's not savings. It's getting the macroeconomic prices right. To me, that's what really drives an economy. The macro prices are interest rates and exchange rates. We did pretty well on interest rates, perhaps too well. We've got a bit of a bubble in places that are pretty costly, and we've done awfully on exchange rates. Marty? Uh, I just have uh, two. Ri uh, it's just fun to have a good argument at this sort of <laughs> stage. So I agree that macro policies are important, but I would argue slightly that you have the cart before the horse, that in the Industrial Revolution, as I think it was Tony, whose student who said it was a, a flood of new gadgets that accounted for it. And look how little financial investment or education was involved in that process. It is the flood of new inventions that come out, for example, from the solo uh, investigations. In, Innovation, I mean, investment plays a role. Macro policies play a role. But compared to the role of the breakthroughs of ideas, we would having, be having the growth rates of the Renaissance, not those of the Industrial yeah, Revolution just, without them. Apply to that. I completely agree. The Industrial Revolution, sure, great innovations, en engineering genius, but that was. 250 years ago, we live in a indust different industrial structure today, a world of oligopolies, large companies, R&D labs. They're the places who are doing that research and development. We need to encourage them to do it, and then when it gets done, to be located in the US. And the problem right now is the incentives, because the macro prices primarily are what is wrong, that when they do it, they do it offshore. They have an incentive to take the plant offshore. We now see more and more R&D following that plant. So. Yes, what worked 250 years ago, but it's a different world today, and I think that that needs to be taken into account. Uh, okay, I, the chair now cuts off this, <laughs> yeah. this debate. Monty, you've got something to say. There's, there's two last points. One is that I have to disagree quite strongly with Tom on the uh, glut of savings argument. The, the reason interest rates are low, that there's so much savings, is we're importing all the savings from abroad. That was much of the point of this morning. And uh, that's just simply uh, that's just simply a fact. I mean, that, that's that's uh, that, that uh, <laughs> household savings are are, are negative, uh, corporate savings are uh, not quite what they say. I was going to make one other point, and that is that probably the best single measure of whether Tom is correct on a second point, uh, firms putting plants in the U.S. versus abroad, is to look at direct investment figures, and uh, actually by a, a tail, you're right. Uh, U.S. firms have been investing slightly more abroad than foreign firms have been investing in the United States, but the gap isn't very big. I've got to come back to both of those points because, <laughs> again, I think they're dead wrong. I mean, the, 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 reason, <laughs> the, the reason why interest... No, the the it, fact it, is not wrong. Maybe I, the interpretation I, 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 is. I'm going mm. to go on the fact, too, because you need to dig into that fact. At the news hour, you're not allowed oh, to I touch have. each other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just point that out. The reason... The, re the, the reason in, the, you've turned a hardball now. That's it, man. <laughs> The, the, the reason, I, I, the, the I'm reason, afraid to go back to the office. The reason interest rates were at their 40 years low was because of the Federal Reserve. Nothing to do with China. China did have some impact on the long end of the bond, of the long bond, by buying some of those longer bond rates. But at 1% and all the short-term rates down there, the Fed lowered the structure of interest rates. China affected the yield curve and the slope of the, the, the curve. And as it's gone back up, that's what China is doing. China is affecting the slope so of the yield curve. So interest rates go down and savings go up? No, it, savings in this economy 
are the outcome of investment decisions largely. That's a saving. Let's, let's, let me go. You're going to put too much of a burden on this particular conversation to deal everything at once. Just stick with the interest rate question. I would contend, and I think most people would contend, the major driving force of interest rates in this economy is the Federal Reserve. China is having a marginal effect on the slope of the yield curve. With regard to FDI, the clearest numbers, what is going on with foreign investment in this country? They are buying existing plant and equipment. What we are interested in is greenfield new plant construction. When Daimler-Benz buys Chrysler, if they just take over all the existing plants, they haven't added a single job, they haven't added a single machine, it's just been a change of ownership. Well, that why don't you go that, to the new capital that, investment that figures and see if it, it supports your point. Okay, guys. <laughs> 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 Fellas. <laughs> We got, <laughs> now you can see why this is such a hard job. Uh, no, I, when you see people actually get expansive, and you imagine what you do when you get this down to eight minutes. Of course, cameras are on them, so people don't act up as much. Phil, say something, and then we're, I'm going to sure, get Ken quick. Hughes back yeah, up. Yeah, no, I was just going to stick up for Steve Roach that, uh, you know, the trade balance and the current account are basically the same thing, and that's an identity same, that equals saving minus investment. So either we have more investment than saving or less saving than investment, that's the same thing. So I, I, basically I'm, not, I'm not sure how to interpret what, you're, what you just said with, with the accounting identity that, that governs all of this. So that's, that's my comment. Well, that's, Ken, we, need a that's sa- it. We, we need a savings forum. <laughs> I think that's the two big that, issues. That's, that's ending on something almost as obscure as Schr- Schrodinger's uh, equation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm going to give it back to, to Kent Hughes here. I, I, just for my own uh, self here, I thank you all enormously. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I kid around about, about your, your arguing with each other, but it sure makes for a much more spirited uh, occasion than one usually is subjected to at something like this. This was a lot of fun, so thank you very much. Well, thank you all. And, of course, thank, uh, very much thanks to, to Ralph and Will. This has been an extraordinary day. I had high expectations, and they have been dramatically exceeded. Uh, as I said to begin with, we really are going to continue this conversation. We already have one uh, panel, uh, one session, rather, one conference in the planning stage. And we, uh, we just listening to the discussion today, I think we have a couple years of discussion coming here. And, of course, we're going to hope to lure all of you back. This is the kind of, as I said, dialogue of democracy that the the Wilson Center really celebrates and what we try to do in terms of clarifying the key choices that face today's decision makers. Special thanks to Paul Salmon who came down from out of town. (laughs) I've been, well, everyone else has been taking notes on uh, the the key economic points here. I've been taking notes on Paul so I can try to sort of capture some of this this facility. And we don't want this conversation to stop. We'd like to invite you all to join us for a reception outside where we can continue this spirited somewhere between uh, Jim Lair and hardball kind of discussion that, that we've developed. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.